very good afternoon, everyone, to our, our value clients and our guest panelists, Mr. Geoffrey and Mr. Chung, and all our participants here today. A very warm welcome to HSBC First Investment Market Outlook for 2023. First, I would like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude for all our uh, participants for taking time from your busy schedule to join us today. So I'm Jessica, a member of the Wealth Team Specialist and also your moderator for today. So our session today will be around 30 minutes to 35 minutes, followed by Q&A sessions. So feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A box and we shall address your questions during the session. So before we start, I would like to invite all of you to share a little information about yourself in the poll that is coming right up to the screen um, now. So um, please take the next you know, 30 seconds to complete the poll, thank you. So thank you everyone for participating in the poll. So um, I think uh, without further ado, now I would like to invite our Head of Asset Management Specialist and also Well Sales, um, Mr. Chong Wing Fong to kickstart our first investment market outlook, Parallel Worlds. Over to you, Mr. Chong. Thanks, Jessica. Hi, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this evening's HSBC Premier Investment Outlook. So as we kick off 2023, we are cognizant of the economic trends that have been evolving at a rapid pace around the world. Parallel worlds. That is how we view these diverging economic trends across the globe. And that is the theme of our investment outlook today. We believe that 2023 will change the game for investors with diverging economic trends in different parts of the world and some big and important shifts in market valuations. It is therefore essential to us as wealth advisors to actually understand these paradigm shifts and to identify where the investment opportunities are. Having a geographical diversified investment portfolio and an active management strategy is essential when investing in parallel worlds. That means staying defensive while on the outlook, sorry, on the lookout for silver linings in the market by building a diversified portfolio of high quality assets and seeking more clarity to take riskier bets. So ladies and gentlemen, in HSBC, we are here to help you build a wealth strategy that works just for you with our suite of investment services. We take time to understand your investment needs carefully and provide you with tailored solutions to help you grow, manage, and preserve your wealth. Our ambition is to be Asia's leading wealth manager opening up a world of opportunities for our clients whenever their wealth is created, invested, and managed. Malaysia as a core, Southeast Asia economy is an important part of that narrative for HSBC, and we are committed to serve your investment needs at day, as they evolve. Our speakers for today will provide you with insights, and we hope you find the discussions informative and useful as you evaluate investment opportunities and structure your portfolios to optimize returns. So feel free to talk or to speak to any of us here and on that note, have an enjoyable and engaging experience. Have a pleasant evening. I will now hand over the floor back to Jessica. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chong. So I think uh, let's move on to the highlights of today's session. So first, a little background information on our esteemed speaker today, Mr. Geoffrey Lund. Uh, Mr. Geoffrey is actually the head of Asia Investment Specialist with HSBC Asset Management based in Hong Kong. He has been in the industry for over 30 years. And prior to Hong Kong, he was managing global port bond portfolios for HSBC Asset Management in London. Prior to that, Geoffrey also worked at the Investor Asset Management where he managed bond portfolios and bond funds for insurance companies as well as the UK local authorities. So without further ado, I would like to pass the floor to Mr. Geoffrey. 
Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to be able to speak to you today. Uh, and thank you for very much for the introduction. Um, uh, Chong Wang mentioned what why we call our um, uh, our outlook parallel worlds uh, for 2023, um, and he explained that we do think that the outlook for uh, uh, developed markets and Western markets is somewhat different from those uh, in the East, and I think that there's a lot of information that where we can demonstrate that that's the case, and that will indeed be a key theme. But the parallel worlds theme, I think, actually goes even further than that, in the sense that uh, I want you to perhaps to imagine a world where there had never been a pandemic. What would that world look like now? What, what stage would we be at? Um, because I think that the pandemic, as often these very disruptive uh, uh, events can be, is an accelerator of existing trends, but also something which has made some significant secular shifts in the way that we need to think about investment and the prospects that we face for 2023. And in order to have a look at what's going to happen in 2023, I think we need to look back at the last 12 months at 2022, which of course was perhaps one of the worst environments for uh, for investment that I've ever known, I I, I was a bit. Sh I'm always a bit shocked when people say that I've been working in markets for 30 years. I have, and if I'm honest, I can't remember a, a, a year that was really worse than 2022. So, if I could ask the operator of the slides just to move to the slide which is called the global poly crisis. So. When we look at this, when we look at the kind of things that were occurring in 2022, perhaps it's not surprising that those investment returns were so poor. But without having uh, some sort of view on what was uh, happening and what was going on and why it caused such a uh, such an issue for global markets, perhaps uh, perhaps this is going to be instructive as to uh, what we uh, are looking for going forward. And of course, some of this was known to us as we entered 2022. Some of these factors were, were, were already familiar, but I think that uh, others were not. And indeed, there were some which were a combination of, uh, of known and unknowns. For instance, if we go and uh, look through this uh, very clever schematic, which my colleagues in London have put together, which shows all of the factors which have been adding to what we call the poly crisis, all these different situations going on and all interrelated. Uh, and we knew that the China economy was facing some significant headwinds but did we really know that there would be almost no policy support for China during 2022, which I think it's fair to say was something which really brought that crisis more into focus. We knew that we were facing some uh, significant challenges on the, uh, on the supply side of the global economy, which was causing uh, inflationary pressure. But did we really think that U.S. inflation uh, would go above 9% uh, when we entered 2022. Um, we we knew that there were global uh, geopolitical in uncertainties that we were facing, but did we really expect such a complete invasion of Ukraine uh, and that the leader of uh, the, the, the Russian Federation would, would then use that in order to really try to uh, screw the global economy into uh, an even more serious situation in order to leverage um, that, political, uh, that political crisis? crisis. And when we look at uh, things like the European gas crisis, I don't think that investors in uh, uh, that, that, that are not based in Europe, and indeed I'm not based in Europe, I'm based in Hong Kong, as the introduction said, but that was an extraordinary situation. We were faced in Europe with a situation whereby some utility bills were actually rising by 10 times, and the amount of money that that sucks out of consumer pockets. But perhaps what we didn't uh, take uh, take such notice of and why it caused such disruption to markets was the fact that 
uh, Europe was actually faced with a situation where it would run out of gas to the point at which coal factories and industries would have to shut down. And this led then, of course, to some degree of, uh, of financial instability. Again, when we look at Europe, what happened in the UK pension system was a truly dramatic impact. We had a very inappropriate policy, which was brought about by the whole um, economic crisis that we were facing. And this led to a huge spike in bond yields, which meant that UK pension funds had a fire sale of assets, which then, of course, had a knock on um, throughout the world. So uh, from that point of view, uh, we really have faced a, a very serious um, situation. Uh, all of these factors are interrelated in the ways that you see in this schematic. And then if we can turn to the next page, please, we can see the result of what's happened here. Now, if I could just spend a moment explaining what this chart, these charts actually mean. Well, um, these are all of the years from 1870 in both the uh, US equity market and also the US treasury market. Um, and so uh, in terms of the coloration, more recent years are in darker colors. So that doesn't represent the actual return within the range. But across the bottom, you can see the range of returns there. So the further the year is to the left, uh, the poorer the return for that market in that particular year. And you can see on the left-hand side that actually equity markets have a fairly normal distribution, not only in terms of the actual number of years that are within each segment, but also uh, the distribution over time. You can see that the, uh, the darker and lighter years are fairly evenly distributed there uh, across the chart. And there you see 2022, uh, which was around about a, 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 a minus 10% um, year for, uh, for, for, for US stocks. And of course, other markets did significantly worse than that. Uh, but there you can see um, that it was a very disappointing year for stocks nonetheless. But on the bond side, you can see that it was much worse. So on the right-hand side, you can see that there's only three years since 1870 that have been as bad for US Treasury returns as 2022. So this is um, deeply catastrophic in, in many ways. Uh, and you can also see that the distribution is not nice and even on the right-hand side. Uh, and I think that that is, uh, from the, 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 that is caused by the fact that the market has changed significantly over this period. And one of the phenomena that we've seen, of course, is that the duration of bond markets has become longer Longer. And duration is a measure of interest rate sensitivity. And therefore, uh, it is likely that returns will be more volatile. And there you see at either end of the distribution, you have more dark years, which are the more recent years. Uh, and I think that this is because of the development we've seen in that market um, over time. So, this is perhaps not that surprising in bond markets because we started 2022 basically with no yield. So the treasury yields themselves were very low in terms of, uh, of the, the forward-looking uh, returns that they could uh, generate and spread. So the risk premium that you might enjoy from investing in corporate and other types of bonds were very, very tight. And you had whole swathes of the global bond market which were uh, uh, starting the year at negative yield. So uh, any sort of situation where we have the prospect of higher interest rates was likely to result in these uh, very, very poor returns that we uh, have seen from the bond market. As a result, there was nowhere to hide. So if we could just have a look at the next page, and I think that this is truly extraordinary. And this is, of course, something which caused such uh, difficulties in 2022. And hopefully, this is not going to occur again. So the, the, the red on this chart uh, is caused by positive correlation. Um, so 
this has nothing to do with the extent of the returns of any asset classes. It is actually the similarity of return between asset classes. So the more red the block, uh, the greater the correlation. And red, as in this case, spells danger because that uh, meant that if any asset class was going down, then it also meant every other asset class was going down too. And here you would expect in normal years and across uh, longer time frames, that the bottom, uh, the bottom uh, right hand side of this uh, chart and the, the top left side of this chart, where fixed income and equity uh, overlap each other, you'd expect those to be in a red color, but you'd expect a lot of green in other parts of this chart where other asset classes are actually able to bail you out of this type of uh, type of situation. But that, of course, was not the case in 2022. And the only place where you actually got some returns uh, which were both non-correlated and therefore positive was in some alternative asset classes. Commodities, obviously, um, gold had a slightly positive year. Uh, and those real return assets, infrastructure, equities, uh, which uh, I, I think that uh, investors uh, should probably have more of within their portfolios on an ongoing basis and now are e easier to actually access uh, and uh, give you greater diversification. So just echoing what uh, Chong Weng said at the beginning, uh, I we do think that diversification is uh, a, a secular theme going forward, which is going to serve investors' portfolio and make them into a much uh, better, uh, better performing uh, uh, portfolios overall. So that's perhaps enough about the past, but I think there are important lessons to learn there. So now when we move into the future, what's in store for 2023? And so if I could ask if we could turn on to the next slide, please. Um, I have to say, I would love to be able to speak to you today and say everything's fantastic, all uh, the roses in the garden are blooming. Uh, unfortunately, I can't really say that that's the case. However, there are definitely some bright spots, some there is light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and so from that perspective, uh, we're we definitely believe it will be a better year in 2023, but we have to accept that there are still risks surrounding. And the first and perhaps most important risk that uh, we need to highlight is that although inflation is slowing down, nevertheless, uh, we are in a situation where we are beginning to experience second round effects from inflation. So we had this situation, of course, whereby the supply side of the economy was so disruptive. And in the second half of 2022, we had this uh, extraordinary levels, the way we went in with ex extraordinary levels in inflation in parts of the economy, uh, used cars, uh, of course, uh, commodity prices surging for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and in, to a different extent in different parts of the world. Uh, and so from, from that point of view, uh, uh, headline inflation rose to places where we'd never seen it before, uh, at least in modern time. Uh, and the problem with this is that uh, where we are at the moment, moving into 2023, is that it is probable that those very high uh, levels of inflation, which were brought about through these uh, idiosyncratic factors, has begun to feed into inflation expectations. And also, uh, from that perspective, workers are going to expect higher wage settlements. And of course, you're seeing this across the world. Many uh, parts of the world are experiencing strikes uh, and, and higher wage demands as those inflation expectations become more embedded into uh, what people feel they need for the future. And this means that the Fed and other central banks is having to lean down on labor demand, because what we had at the end of the pandemic is uh, a very slow 
return to the workforce. I think that it had changed a lot of people's expectations about what they wanted from their lives, what they wanted from their working lives, what they wanted from the future. Many of them were very slow to return uh, to the workplace. And this has led to a mismatch of supply and demand in labor supply uh, and demand in both the US and Europe in particular. And therefore, the only choice left to central banks is to try and lean down on this demand quite hard. And the only way it could do that is by raising interest rates. And that is why we've seen these unprecedentedly uh, precedently quick uh, increases and tightening of monetary policy in the US and Europe in particular. And that's where we are. This is why we're saying that wage pressures uh, are now um, to the fore. But of course, inflation is coming down and we think it's set to continue to come down uh, because of those base effects and because um, in, higher interest rates are going to at some point do their job. So uh, from that perspective, we are not saying that inflation is going to be high and above central banks targets forever. But what we are saying, and this is the big secular shift in inflation uh, that we need to acknowledge, which has happened post the pandemic, is that inflation is going to average at higher levels than it did between the global financial crisis and COVID. And perhaps it's difficult to imagine now, but almost every developed market central bank in the whole world undershot their inflation target both chronically and significantly over that period. And so what we're saying is that inflation is going to average at higher levels over that time. Uh, and uh, and from, from that point of view, that is uh, something that we need to factor into uh, our investment view as we go forward. So if we could just move to the next slide, please, in terms of what is happening in the economy at the moment. Uh, and we have, of course, got to remember that, uh, as I said, that rates have already risen significantly in certain parts of the world. And it is the intention of central banks to call the economy uh, and uh, reduce demand and therefore balance supply and demand uh, in a more uh, uh, in, in a way to get inflationary forces into greater equilibrium. We're therefore quite surprised how sanguine many forecasters are, particularly about US GDP. And if you look at the chart on the right hand side, you can see that our forecast is significantly more pessimistic about uh, the level of growth in, in the US uh, in the third and the fourth quartile of 2023. We actually think that the economy is likely to actually outperform expectations in the first two quarters of the year, uh, but then uh, the recession is going to be somewhat deeper than, uh, than central banks are, 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 and forecasters are currently expecting. And this would also apply to the euro area in the UK as well. Now, on the left-hand side, there, we're talking about what we call our now casts. So our now casts are an attempt to work out what is happening in economies right now. Uh, we think that that is more reliable than trying to forecast six or 12 months forward. Um, at, but a lot of the uh, data that we see is actually very backwards looking. So if we can just concentrate on those very, very current uh, uh, data that we can see and update our models quickly enough, then we have a better chance of really having our finger on the pulse. And you can see that momentum in the US, in the Euro area, in the UK is firmly to the downside. In Japan, it's actually flat. And Japan is obviously uh, a very interesting situation uh, at the moment, perhaps going to be one of the, the better performing economies in 2023, which is not something we've been able to say for some time. And you can see that India is also uh, in expansionary territory and set to grow strongly in 2023. Now, of course, the wild card here is China. And uh, of course, 
things have dramatically changed in China in terms of the performance of the market that we've seen over the last few weeks. But also, I think it's fair to say in the prospects uh, in terms of uh, of really three factors. The first factor, which was uh, has ended up being opposite, I think, to what investors expected and why investors became so pessimistic about China last October is the political situation. So what uh, was concerning global investors at that point was the consolidation of power around Xi Jinping. In fact, what has actually ended up is that Xi Jinping has uh, enabled a mechanism whereby policy can be much more quickly decided and then implemented. And so from that pers- perspective, that re- leads us on to the second point, it, which is the, the fact that policy has now become much more supportive in almost every aspect of the economy. And the third part of this story, of course, is the opening up post-COVID, which has occurred far more quickly, I think, than most commentators were expecting. Now, if we look at the performance of economies post opening up over COVID, we have a lot of data about this now. Uh, I don't think there's ever been any more data that uh, that economists have uh, about anything than what has happened during the COVID period. Um, so hopefully we'll be more um, uh, well informed if it were to, uh, God forbid, happen again. Um, but nevertheless, what we see and what I think is completely rational is that it does take some time for the benefits of loosening COVID restrictions to come into play, because of course it causes significant infections all over the country. That then slows economic activity because people don't go out, people aren't available to work in the service industry, and they're not able to work in manufacturing either, and therefore uh, manufacturing also slows down for a short while. But the benefits uh, in a reasonably uh, good time scale, uh, then come begin to come on stream. A dramatic increase in activity in all sector, and of course, because of the the uh, the fact that Chinese people have not been able to travel for such a long time, this could have a very beneficial effect to insert on certain economies in in Southeast Asia, which are uh, particularly reliant on on tourism. So from that point of view, we are far more optimistic on China uh, than uh, than the current consensus um, uh, uh, implies. But we believe quite strongly that the consensus will catch up with our, uh, our forecasts as time goes on. Um, and therefore, you can see very clearly that there is this uh, this 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 very obvious disparity between the performance of Asia and the performance of uh, the tra- traditional developed markets. Because on top of, uh, of the phenomenon uh, of China, of course, you have a situation in Asia where inflation hasn't been as high as it uh, was in uh, the US and the Eurozone, where many central banks have actually been very Uh, preemptive in terms of raising interest rates. And so now they're reaching a modest peak in interest rates and the economy should be able to function reasonably well. And we're not seeing the likelihood of this very significant slowdown that we uh, are expecting in the US uh, and the Eurozone. So uh, we maintain the theme that the immediate outlook is still quite risky. Uh, still quite a lot of, um, uh, of danger for the, um, for, for the global markets to digest. So one of the, conundrum, uh, the conundrums at the moment, of course, is the fact that uh, particularly in developed markets, the equity market does not seem to have discounted any sort of earnings recession. And it is very unlikely if we get a recession overall in the economy, particularly to the extent uh, that we are forecasting, that you won't have at least a significant slowdown in earnings, uh, if not an outright um, earnings recession. 
At the same time, fun financial conditions are quite tight and likely to become tighter, which is uh, the very aim of the policy that we're seeing implemented by global central banks. So again, this is something that uh, is still a significant potential headwind to um, the global economy. And calibrating those financial conditions is very difficult. So when we engineer a slowdown, which is what is uh, actually um, what central banks obviously are doing, then actually stopping it at the right place, saying we've done enough now. Inflation is going to uh, inflation is is going to uh, is going to slow down and move back to target. Uh, that then. Uh, maybe takes a significant lag for economies then to begin to recover. So we shouldn't be complacent in 2023, but we do think that better days are ahead. And these per these uh, uh, periods don't last forever. And of course, what we've seen already in 2023 is markets performing actually extremely well. Are markets already discounting some of this bad news that I've talked about, the, the, the further rises in interest rates uh, and that earnings? Uh, recession. Well, we don't actually think so. That is not our central view. We still think that uh, the, the equity prices are, particularly in developed markets, are likely to uh, to go lower before they go higher. So, you know, I, we know that we've seen a, a, a rally in equities so far this year, uh, but we think that there uh, you will get better entry points. But uh, for some asset classes, we think that maybe this is a good time to average in. Some of those asset classes I've already alluded to, uh, Asian equities, for instance, but also many bond markets, which have seen a very uh, significant uh, improvement in terms of their valuations over time. And the, some of these secular themes that I think are particularly important to take into account, and some of these could be positive or negative, uh, you can see we've separated these into policy, into demand side forces, and also supply side uh, uh, forces as well. Uh, and from that point of view, uh, again, we just need to take into account of these in order to be able to in order to be able to assess the risks moving into 2023 obviously throughout europe and also in china we have to uh, work out what the implication is of aging economies uh, we need to work out what the implications are of new government policies designed to address inequality, which may not be uh, positive for markets. And maybe this is the time when the global indebtedness begins to catch up with us, because of course, uh, when interest rates are zero, being in debt is not so challenging. Uh, when interest rates are rather higher than that, and as mentioned, we think that the average is going to be higher in the coming years, then that is something which, uh, which obviously does act as a drag on consumption. Uh, and this uh, then therefore will be re resulted in the policy choices that we see in the middle. We've already seen in China that some of the policies, some of the fiscal policies are more designed to, uh, to contribute to fairness rather than aggregate economic growth. That might be something that is continued in China and also adopted in other parts of the world. And then on the supply side, um, the end of hyper-globalization and a more fragmented world may lead to those greater inefficiencies, which could lead to that higher level of inflation um, that I was talking about. And finally, of course, you have the um, the 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 impact of uh, climate policy and the transition to net zero, which, which again could add to inefficiencies within the supply chain for very good reasons. Uh, but nevertheless, this could force prices higher as dirtier industries are demised uh, and the supply of cleaner industries doesn't match that mismatch in the short term. So, if we just go back to the uh, polycrisis slide, which we uh, which we talked about earlier, thank you very much. Then you can we can then make 
perhaps a, a little bit more sense of uh, of uh, of where we think going into 2023. Well, as mentioned, we have had a very significant reversal in Chinese policy, and that we believe should be able to reverse the uh, China slowdown. Inflation is already falling. Uh, as mentioned, this may be sticky on the downside for various reasons, but nevertheless, I think we are well past the peak and higher interest rates are going to address these issues. Um, European gas prices have actually collapsed because supply chains have healed themselves much more quickly. Uh, and therefore, from that perspective, uh, th then uh, then these spikes in prices are something which prove to be temporary, even though, again, uh, the price is still, um, is still elevated. This has led to actually quite good financial conditions that we've seen, of course. Bond markets have reopened to new issuance. Equity markets have been rising in 2023 so far. And emerging markets are actually uh, amongst some of our most, uh, most um, significant underweights in our global portfolio. And so from that perspective, uh, we are more optimistic in 2023. So just finally moving on to, to the, the, the final uh, slide, we do believe that there are already um, significant um, opportunities which are growing in fixed income markets. So we think it is safe now to average into those markets. And emerging market debt, for instance, we think is uh, an attractive proposition. We've already seen that massive rally in Asian high yield. Uh, and also we think that some alternative uh, uh, um, asset classes such as infrastructure debt uh, are uh, attractive at these levels. And we've also seen valuation um, uh, premiums on some emerging market and Asian uh, equity markets where we feel that there is, again, an opportunity already to invest in these. And, it, and we have seen that materialize in terms of uh, what has been obviously a fantastic performance from the Chinese equity market uh, that we've seen um, year to date. So from that point of view, we are uh, is 2023 going to be better than 2022? Yes, we would absolutely say that that would be the case. Has all the risk gone away? No, it hasn't. We need to be careful. We need to be selective and we need to actively manage our portfolios to source those best uh, opportunities. And we could still experience some volatility and weakness without a a doubt. But confidence, confidence, we think, is justified as we move into the new year. Uh, and uh, even in some of those more vulnerable assets, we think that it's time to start averaging in because at the end of the day, none of us know where the very bottom is. Uh, and markets certainly seem to have greater confidence as we move into the new year. So that is all that I'm going to say on a formal basis, but we have some time left and I'd be delighted to take any, any questions. Thank you, Jeffrey, for the very insightful sharing. And definitely you've put a lot of perspective into uh, our market moving into 2023. So let's kickstart the Q&A sessions. I do have a number of questions here. So um, first of all, uh, I would like to touch on inflation, right? Because you've been mentioning about inflation and how the Fed has been moving in terms of the tightening. So inflation has been, you know, much higher and stickier than expected, expected. And this actually caused the Fed to tighten way above expectations. So do you think these trends will continue as we move into 2023? I think to a degree it will. I, I don't think that the Fed have stopped um, raising interest rates. And one of the reasons they haven't stopped raising interest rates is that there is just isn't enough evidence yet to show that the economy is slowing down. So what they need to see 
is they need to see some sort of capitulation from the labor market. They need some weaker labor market figures uh, until they are satisfied that they don't need to continue to ratchet up interest rates into uh, what economists call restrictive territory. So uh, that type of territory where it will actually clamp down on, uh, on demand in the economy. Um, that doesn't mean they'll go on forever. It doesn't mean that they're going to go way o o above 5% um, because at some point they will say, well, this is enough. This, this is enough to actually slow down that demand on the, the labor market side. Um, but in terms of slowing, uh, uh, completely stopping interest rate hikes, now they haven't got enough uh, evidence to see that that is appropriate. So, uh, so we would agree really with the market consensus as to where interest rates will peak. All right. So, with the core inflation seems to be you know trending in the right directions. Uh, so, we still don't think that the Fed is ready to you know cut interest rate anytime end of the year or you know, moving into twenty twenty four. Yes, I, I think that that's quite possible. We, we, do, we do believe that the Fed could be on an easing bias at the very least by the end of 2023, uh, partly because, I mean, we have to remember how sharp and, uh, and large the interest rate hikes have been. And also we live in quite a different world to the one we lived in uh, at other times of, uh, of significant increases in interest rates and there's because of the indebtedness that i mentioned um smaller increases in interest rates probably make a bigger difference to the overall demand picture within an economy so that i'm sure that they will be very prepared to support the economy on the other side when they see that inflation is under control and that the overall economy is struggling because we have to remember that you know the fed has a dual mandate it's not just about um, inflation they also have an obligation to support growth as, and the labor market as well thanks jeff um i think one of the key headwinds this year and also a very common topic that we get from our clients is recession, right? So um, many experts are also saying that, you know, economy recessions, you know, likely will happen this year. Uh, so do we actually think that uh, uh, HSBC forecast, right? Uh, do we still forecast a positive market or is it still a right time to do some dollar cost averaging? And if, let's say, we, uh, if clients were to do that, right, which industry or which sectors, you know, should they put their money in? Well, there's a lot of questions there. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think that the, uh, the, the answer is uh, that, yes, we do expect a recession in the U.S., that the recession is going to be fairly sharp, but it's also going to be fairly short-lived at, at, at the same time. So in old parlance, you might call it a V-shaped recovery. Uh, now, in those circumstances, of course, markets look through economic weakness, or at least should. Uh, as I say, the biggest sort of puzzle for us is that that this is likely to, by historical standards, to lead to an earnings recession, and that is not discounted by economic U.S. equity markets at the moment. Now, uh, is the market being super um, uh, foresighted and looking even beyond that? I think it's possible, but that uh, that as I mentioned, we we would um, our, our view overall is that equities probably have to come down a little bit further in the U.S. Uh, in order to in order to compensate for that factor. Um, nevertheless, we still think that there could be good returns from other markets, including Asia, during uh, that time. Uh, and so I, I think that, that, that your question about dollar cost averaging is uh, a fair one. Um, that if you have, uh, if you did, um, if you did do reasonably well last year by being out of the market, then, um, then you don't want to be out for too long. Um, 
And then the other question about which sort of sectors that we favor. Uh, I mean, in the bond market, we, we do favor some of the Asian asset classes. They show good levels of valuation. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, for instance, Asia high yield is very uh, technical and um, complex market, but nevertheless, so we still think there is some further way to go for that to recover. In terms of equity markets, um, we do like East Asia. Uh, we think that the valuations there are very attractive. In terms of sectors, we we prefer some uh, the the uh, healthcare, consumer staples, those which tend to be a little bit more um, more resilient to economic weakness. Um, so, so yes, definitely opportunities in 23, uh, but nevertheless, um, I think it's important to be selective and actually it's a year where being selective in the right way may actually be very helpful. Thank you, Jeff. Um, with China, you know, recently has been reopening quite, uh, quite abruptly, right, in major cities and opening borders in the last past few weeks, right? Uh, how do you think you know China reopening would impact on the global inf inflation and also the global growth? And you know, which regions tend to benefit most from the China reopening team? Yeah, sure. Well, um, I, I mean, the the question about inflation is one that I'm asked quite a lot, and uh, I, I guess that part of the hypothesis of inflation falling significantly um, over the early parts of uh, 2023 was based on the fact that there wouldn't be much demand from China, excuse me, and then also perhaps uh, that the implications that would have for commodity prices. Um, but as I mentioned, the the recovery in the Chinese economy is going to take some time yet because of that uh, the, the the initial reaction to the um, recalibration of the COVID policies is going to is, is going to take time, uh, and from that perspective, you might actually see some pretty disastrous economic numbers coming out of China in the next few months because, of course, December was. Um, the, the economy hadn't had time to react to any positive policy impulse. January, COVID spread very, very uh, rapidly. Uh, February, Chinese New Year. Um, so it's going to take some time, I think, for the Chinese economy to react in such a way uh, that it might add to uh, to to global demand to such an extent that it will have a meaningful impact on, say, U.S. inflation. And as we've as we know, um, Chinese inflation is much lower, and the Chinese economy is fairly um, is fairly self contained. Um, and I think that if you were going to see a significant reaction from commodity prices, you'd already have done it. Uh, and uh, we haven't seen such a dramatic increase uh, over the last few weeks that would imply that this is going to have a really negative impact on uh, on global inflation. But it's something to watch, of course. It's important to, to keep an eye on these things. Um, uh, in terms of who might benefit from uh, China opening up. Well, I mentioned those parts of Southeast Asia, which uh, would certainly benefit from an increase in Chinese tourism. Uh, that is, is a very meaningful uh, outcome for, for some of those countries. Um, but of course, commodity producers um, may perform well. Uh, and I think that in general, what you actually have is uh, again, as you had in 2008, is at the point at which the U.S. economy is beginning to slow down. You have China improving. And from that perspective, it might keep the whole global economy in much greater equilibrium than would otherwise have been the case. So I think that one can generally see it as quite a positive phenomenon. So... Um while well, China has been recurring pretty well, and also we can see that the Hang Seng Index has actually, you know, uh, grew to six months high this uh, in the past two weeks, right? Um, 
do you think that the growth in Asia or you know, coming from China, recovery especially, would it be sustainable enough to drive further upsides in the market? Um, given that you know there's continuous pressure on the hawkish Fed as well as a strong US dollar. Well, uh, two things there. Just on the premise of the question, the, the dollar hasn't been particularly strong lately, uh, and also the Fed isn't going to remain hawkish forever. Uh, and so I think that we would generally be quite optimistic uh, that the momentum in those markets that you mentioned would continue. Um, there are still some outstanding valuations available in those markets. Uh, and don't forget, of course, that Hong Kong is also in a similar position where having been effectively closed really since 2019 in the case of Hong Kong because of the, uh, because of, uh, the, the social unrest that was taking place here um, during that time, the rebound could really be very significant. Uh, and, and therefore, for yes, I, 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 we are quite optimistic about Greater China. In, in general, um, is there any particular sectors that do you, uh, that the clients you know, can look into, um, you know, to take the opportunity to enter now? Well, I think it's nuanced. I think I think it's uh, it's a bit of a bottom up kind of question. I mean, when when we're talking about the sort of Chinese and, and Hong Kong market, then uh, of course there are obvious implications for those stocks which are focused on leisure industries and airlines and that type of thing. Uh, the same in Southeast Asia. Uh, when you look at East Asia, of course, um, global trade and technology is something which is particularly uh, important. So I, I think we do need to do some bottom-up work, but all of those sectors that I've mentioned, I think, have potential upside, uh, um, uh, upside volatility because some of the valuations are far more pessimistic than this part of the world has has ended up being, and therefore, uh, and therefore, we do think that there is uh, there there is some there is good good opportunity in several of those sectors. All right, thank you, Jeff. So, I think in interest of time, probably a uh, one last questions. So, um. So coming into 2023, right, how should our clients position themselves this year? You know, uh, which asset class would likely, um, uh, can they focus on and, you know, with slowing growth in the West and also reopening earning team in the East. So which asset class should they focus on? Um, any opportunities within the ESG space as well? Well, as, as I mentioned, you know, the, the ESG is going to have an important impact on on the whole macroeconomic conjuncture for the world as we go forward. Some of it is going to be somewhat disruptive in terms of uh, of uh, governments having to move to towards a, a more carbon neutral future, uh, and that uh, but that does provide significant opportunities for investors, and that is something that you might see a reacceleration of, particularly in Greater China, given the likelihood of a better. Uh, economic uh, picture than was uh, was originally expected. Um, so yes, we do believe that there will be um, significant opportunities in ESG, and already just this this year. So within the last couple of weeks, we've seen a huge increase in um, ESG related bond issuance. Um, in terms of what you should invest in, I, I think that. Um, I think it calls for even more diversification than we've had before, because if you if you had had a portfolio with more real assets in, for instance, last year, more commodities, uh, more um, more infrastructure debt, that type of thing, you, then you would have done better than um, than was the case if you'd had a pure 60-40 bond equity portfolio. I do think the bonds and equities will both do well in 2023, um, but uh, uh, of course. There are those headwinds that I, I spoke about, um, but generally speaking, we're, we're, we're quite enthusiastic. So, so, so the key takeaway in terms of what to invest in would be uh, keep diversified, keep selective. Um, in the beginning of the year, we probably favour bonds over equities, but bonds are looking quite attractive. So, um, so corporate indices now have yield. 
uh, and from that perspective, uh, you should get make uh, have a better uh, um, a better prospects for 2023. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, that this is an excellent takeaway for our clients today. So I think that's the end of our session. Thank you once again, Jeffrey, for your insightful sharing. And unfortunately, we have come to the end of the Q&A session due to the time constraint, right? So for those questions that we are not able to answer today, uh, do feel free to reach out to your relationship managers, right? Before we go today, we would like to invite our participants to basically share your thoughts and opinions on today's event, right? We hope this session has been insightful for you and will be beneficial uh, and enjoyable one. And of course, before we leave, today and I would like to wish all of you who are celebrating the Chinese New Year a happy Chinese New Year and for those who are not celebrating happy holidays so thank you everybody and have a good evening <laughs>